Yeah. Okay, you guys, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to uh, Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, I think we have a, a special treat today. We have a, a visiting uh, guest uh, who has been uh, invited by Dr. Jeff Callen uh, to give us a talk on a topic um, that is very timely and I don't care, you know, what specialty or subspecialty that you're in. I know that if you pick up one of your major journals, there is going to be an article about this. And that is, of course, the topic of uh, physician burnout. So, Jeff, do you want to uh, introduce our speaker? Yeah, so we're not going to hear about, uh, you know, rashes or uh, skin lesions or skin cancer or the skin cancer epidemic today. Um, we're going to hear uh, more about uh, mindfulness and about uh, physician burnout and how you uh, how you handle it from uh, uh, personal experience. Um, Dr. Jones uh, is a ear, nose and throat physician. Uh, he uh, trained, uh, he did, went to medical school here uh, and then he went off for a year to uh, one of the uh, state universities in New York for his internship. Then he came back here to the ENT residency. Um, and eventually he met uh, one of my residents, uh, or I, maybe you met her as a medical student or whatever, but Evelyn, his uh, wife, uh, was a dermatology resident. And they uh, left uh, Louisville, I don't know, some more than 20 years ago or so, and, uh, and uh, set up practices in uh, Owensboro, uh, Kentucky. Sean has uh, been the president, I believe, of the KMA uh, and has been involved in organized medicine. And um, it was uh, last uh, Labor Day when uh, my wife and I were decided we needed to visit the uh, quilt museum uh, that we took the opportunity to rekindle our friendship with uh, Sean and Evelyn and uh, had dinner with them. And Sean was telling me his uh, story and uh, he was uh, talking about this book that he wrote. So I, I can do this because uh, I'm not sure he gets, even if he gets royalties from this, I'm not sure they're, they amount to a hill of beans compared to his practice. But um, but it's a uh, but he wrote a book about finding uh, heart in art and uh, and about uh, mindfulness and about uh, physician burnout and he's going to tell us a bit about his story so that we can uh, learn hopefully from him and avoid uh, uh, and, and deal with the uh, the problem. So Sean, without further ado, let me have you come up and uh, Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. So let me just say, first of all, that uh, I feel a little bit like I've returned to the scene of the crime because this is where the general surgery department uh, held grand rounds as well as mortality and morbidity conference, which will strike fear into the heart of any chief resident who has to present. So I appreciate tremendously, uh, and even words are, are beggared to describe how appreciative I am of the opportunity to be here today and talk about a topic that's really important to me and I think is important to you as well and I'm very passionate about. Sometimes you choose the topic and sometimes the topic chooses you and this topic sort of chose me. But Jeff and his wife Susan were incredibly gracious and their hospitality has been incredible and it's just been a joy to be with them and, and to meet some other uh, department members last night at dinner so I appreciate it and again it's good to be with you. So. A few years ago, I was getting ready for surgery one morning, shaving actually, when I sort of acutely suddenly became aware that I wasn't feeling anything. It wasn't that I couldn't feel my face or that I cut myself shaving, but I came in that moment horrified at the fact that I recognized with a sense of abject intellectual terror that I wasn't feeling anything, that I had absolutely no emotion. And so I immediately did what any highly trained, functional, competent, intelligent physician would do, and I ignored it. And I pretended it would, it would go away, that uh, somehow this, this thing that had enveloped me would dissipate, and of course it didn't. And over the ensuing weeks and months, this emotional numbness sort of surrounded me and I descended into this sort of metaphoric abyss, as it were, and if it were not for Evelyn, whom Jeff mentioned my wife, 
things might have ended very different for me. So fortunately, she helped me to recognize that it was important at that moment that I lay aside my scalpel and take some time off and work on myself as a human being. And so that's what I did. I took six weeks off. I went to the Center for Professional Excellence in Nashville, Tennessee, and underwent six weeks of outpatient intensive psychotherapy and was diagnosed during that period with post-traumatic stress disorder-related depression. And as a result of, of that journey, uh, then I was able to go back to practicing medicine. And while everything in life is not an on-off switch, this certainly wasn't either, uh, it has been a journey that's been progressively improving and getting better as time goes on. And I, I love being a physician. I, in a sense, have always loved being a physician. And so what happened to me was very difficult to understand, especially when you get to the, the idea that I was having difficulty finding joy in my work. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a minute as well. So I am a surgeon, and so I'm sort of out of my element here. Uh, amongst the thinking part of our breed, as it were. <laughs> but what does it mean to be a surgeon? Well, in part it means that I was taught, and I believe a chance to cut is a chance to cure. The only way to heal is with ice cold steel. And the really bad thing about being on call every other night is you miss half the good stuff. But my favorite is, how many surgeons does it take to change a light bulb? One. He holds the bulb up and waits for the world to revolve around him. <laughs> and the world better revolve around it, if you know what I'm saying. So a couple of years ago, I was at uh, the dinner table, and, and one of my sons, actually Caleb, who's here uh, with me today, he came up to me and said, Dad, he had his braces put on a few days before. He said, my, my mouth is really hurting. I, I wish you'd take a look at it. And I said, well, I'd, I'd, I'd be glad to. So I got a light, asked him to open up his mouth, and I looked in his, his mouth, and, and he said, uh, I said, you've got some superficial ulcerations that are kind of all over your buccal mucosa. I said, wow, Caleb, I'm sorry. That looks like it really hurt. And he looked at me as if he were examining a stranger, and he said, Dad, that sounds like compassion. And... So while we might talk about how it's difficult to think about what it means to be a surgeon, I've written a book. I don't have any other conflicts of interest. When we talk about burnout, the first thing that really comes to mind is compassionate care. And you might ask yourself, well, what in the world does compassion have to do with burnout? And the fact of the matter is that burnout the key to understanding it is really linked to this idea of compassionate care. And it isn't just what we usually think about, compassionate care with respect to the care that the physician extends towards the patient, but it's also the compassion that one has one for oneself as well as other physicians. Because it turns out that the physician-patient relationship is just that, and while I think we understand relationships are bidirectional, we have almost always thought about the physician-patient relationship in one direction only. And so it's going to be important that we talk about it in a bi-directional way. So what is burnout? If we had a picture of burnout, it might look something like this. What seems to be the problem, Mrs. Johnson? I feel the way you look. And so this cartoon sort of begs the question, what does a doctor have to give when there's nothing left to give? Peabody has what might be considered an obiter dictum from a lecture he gave to the Harvard Medical School class of 1927, where he said, the secret in caring for the patient is to care for the patient. It's been suggested that we modify that to the secret to caring for the patient is caring for oneself while we care for the patient. So when we look at burnout from a standpoint of research, it's actually uh, Christine Maslach who has done the early part of the work on this. And 
there are three dimensions through which one experiences burnout, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a loss of a sense of personal accomplishment. That's what I was talking about, losing that joy in work. And so emotional exhaustion is, I don't really think I can deal with another patient today. I feel like I'm kind of becoming callous toward my patients would be depersonalization or the gallbladder in room 327 where we objectify people. And then the loss of personal accomplishment, feelings of competence, success, well, it's actually reverse scored on the Maslach burnout inventory, which is the gold standard of self-reported examination, 22 questions, which tells you what your risk of burnout is. It turns out that there's a little bit of difference between men and women and how they experience burnout and that women more likely or more commonly experience emotional exhaustion first. Men tend to experience depersonalization first and there are exceptions to that rule. But we all sort of end up with a loss of a sense of personal accomplishment. There's not much in terms of professionalism or professions that has more of a sense of fundamental meaning embedded in it than being a doctor. And yet, this process of burnout robs people of that sense of fundamental meaning in their work. And in, in that sense alone, it's a travesty. A Maslach, you may remember Philip Zimbardo's famous Stanford experiment where they replicated a prison in the basement of the psychology building. She was the young graduate student who threw up the red flag and said that well, something crazy is going on here. We need to stop this. And that experience sort of led her into this idea of work-related stress, uh, of which burnout is uh, part of the... Hmm. So... Oliver Sacks, a famous neurologist, said if a man has lost a leg or an eye, he knows he has lost a leg or an eye. But if he has lost the self, himself, he cannot know it because he is no longer there to know it. And so one of the things about burnout I think that's really important to understand as we talk about trying to prevent burnout or to mitigate burnout or to treat burnout or however you want to describe it, is that it requires a tremendous amount of self-awareness about who you are, what you want, what you're feeling, what just happened, and maintaining that in an environment where many times it seems everything and everyone is trying to get you to not know what you're doing, what you're feeling, and how things are going, and where you are, and how that's affecting you. And so in that sense, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. And we'll talk about that just a little bit. But that sense of self-awareness about really recognizing your internal environment and how that's reacting with your external environment is really important. You know, you can just imagine what that kind of talk is like in a surgery department. Um, and so many of us have a lot of barriers to even having these kinds of discussions at all. And so one of the things I think is really important is that we just begin to have the discussion and become aware of it. The Sufi mystic Rumi once said that the man who has a good friend doesn't need a mirror. And so we think about self-awareness. It's really important that we live in community because other people can help tell us what it's like the experience of being with us. And towards that end, I'd like you to watch this little video. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah, well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop trying to fix it. 
No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't <laughs> try to sleep. It. So awareness, being willing to listen, truly listen to people's experience of you is really important. And that's funny uh, because of how true it is about the way we take constructive criticism sometimes. So Medscape began measuring physician burnout in 2013, and it was about 40% at that point. In 2017, the, the last year they did the comprehensive survey, some 40,000 respondents, it had increased to 51%, which is a 25% increase over uh, a four-year period, and, and that's really where people started to set up and take notice about this. The average professional CEO organizational uh, idea of burnout, uh, which Freudenberger first described in 74, looking at free health clinics, was around 32%. So even when we started this uh, sort of journey in 2013, we were above the norm in that respect to the percentage of prevalence burnout. But to have that more than 25% jump in four years really got people alarmed. Similar study by not Medscape, but Shanna Felt and colleagues, Derby and West and others at Mayo Clinic confirmed that they had an, uh, a rate of like 54% with uh, greater than 40,000 respondents. And so this idea of we, we are dealing with an epidemic, epidemic in the sense that uh, one out of every two physicians or more is suffering from symptoms of burnout. And the problem is it isn't just a static thing. I may be burned out today and tomorrow I may be great. Uh, there is a sense in which burnout is a long-term course, uh, but there's also a sense in which I can feel pretty good about today and not feel so good about tomorrow. And so people are sort of lapsing in and out of burnout as well. And if you look at the, um, the severity, we skipped the slide, this is actually a severity report. Uh, urologists, otolaryngologists were at the top of the list, but actually in terms of prevalence, the emergency department, um, general surgery, those types of uh, professions or specialties tend to be more uh, severely hit in terms of prevalence. And in fact, some reports, there are two reports on general surgery residents that say their uh, percentage of prevalence of burnout is over 70%. And so I think having an awareness of, of that, you know, if you are in that specialty helps. I think having an awareness of that if you're not in that specialty and you're dealing with these people as consultants makes a difference. And so who we are, where we are, all that makes a difference. And because if you think about it, the experience of your day, the patients that you take care of, uh, being a pulmonologist in a critical care unit is highly related to a risk of burnout. All of those professions are completely different in terms of their daily existence and what they do. And it turns out that one of the things that really predisposes us to burnout is when there's a mismatch between who I am as an individual and the work I'm called to do, and particularly if I'm obstructed by something, it doesn't matter what it is, in, in doing the work that I think is important for me to do each and every day for each and every patient. So for example, if an insurance company keeps me from giving the drug that I think is the best drug for this patient, and that happens repetitively, then I feel like I'm not providing the best care. It is my goal, it is my mission, it is my purpose and in life to provide 
what I know is the best care for and quality, highest quality care for that patient, then I'm at risk for burnout. And in fact, Maslach, while we talk about depersonalization and we talk about um, a loss of sense of personal accomplishment, emotional exhaustion, those are dimensions through which we study burnout and how it affects people. But at the end of the day, in her book, The Truth About Burnout, she said that burnout is an erosion of the soul. And Marianne Williamson said, the soul is the truth of who I am. And if you sort of combine those, then it's a loss of who I am as a person that, that burnout assaults and results in. And so getting back to who I am is a deeper work than just addressing EMR issues and things like that. And so there's sort of this dichotomy about trying to change things at an organizational level and trying to change things on a personal level that's really important. Because we all work in organizations, and while we recognize that this is an organizational issue to the extent that 51% of the people in medicine are not burning out because we're bad people or we're weak or we weren't trained appropriately, in fact, if you look at the studies that Shanafelt has done, by and large, students that are entered or matriculate to medical school are more well-adjusted their, than their peers by far. By the third year of medical school, we've driven that out of them, and they suffer anxiety and depression and a risk of suicide that is two to three times higher than the general population. And so we're losing 400 physicians a year to suicide, and women are suffering that at two to three. 0.3 times the general rate of women who commit suicide in the general population, men at like 1.5. So something has to be done organizationally. There's no doubt about that. This is an organizational stress issue. But is there anyone here who thinks changing the direction of the university, for example, is going to be an easy thing that we can do with a single committee meeting? And so we recognize the inherent difficulties in getting the organization to change. And on top of that, compassion is the normal human experience in response to suffering. The normal human response to the recognition of suffering. And compassion is really recognizing that suffering and having a, de a desire then to alleviate it. Well, it may be a normal human response to suffering. But organizations are not human. And so while they are not inherently evil, compassion is not their normal response to the recognition of suffering. And so that really helps me because when I bump up against my system, which happens to be Baptist Health Kentucky or the Baptist Medical Group, and there's some wall of resistance to what I consider to be a compassion issue, then I have to check myself about recognizing, okay, this is an organization. It's not that the people are not compassionate. It's the organization's normal response is not compassion. And so I have to deal with myself then. I think that's where I have a tendency, and we all have a tendency, to get a little bit amiss in not wanting to do the personal work because we feel like if we say, I need to do this, and I need to do this, and I need to do this to avoid burnout, that that then is implicating me as being responsible for suffering burnout. And I tell people, although I admit I'm a surgeon, I know nothing about diabetes, I liken it to diabetes and that it may not be your fault that you have diabetes, but it is your responsibility to treat it and to take care of yourself to mitigate the consequences against that diabetic diagnosis. As if slide. As if it wasn't difficult enough, I'm going to just tell you that Rodenstein and colleagues at Harvard published a paper in September of 2018 that was a meta-analysis, it was actually an attempted meta-analysis about the prevalence of phys physician burnout. And they looked at 800 studies from across the world, all different specialties, and tried to, to analyze those. And what they found was the definitions of burnout were so varied. The instruments used, while predominantly the Maslach burnout inventory, which is the gold standard, they used different criteria to determine when someone's burned out and when they weren't. 
and the tools they used to treat burnout or mitigate burnout were all different and not standardized. And so they really, in the end, it was sort of a, a call for a recognition that we don't have a great definition of burnout and that we don't have great tools to look at burnout and a, and a call to develop those in order to really get a handle on what are the best evidence-based practices, practices to institute both on an organizational and a personal level to mitigate against burnout. So the causes of burnout, if you look at any study, the electronic health record is like by far and away the number one cause. And that's physician self-reported like, this is what causes me the most stress. They don't ask, you know, what causes you burnout. They ask what really stresses you out during the day. And the EHR is, is one. Now, the EHR for most of you who are in training is probably a different stress for it than it is for me because the, you know, it was my son the other night was talking about trying to teach me to turn around in Call of Duty. It was like, you know, a five lesson thing that took three days and then I still wasn't any good. He goes, bam, dad, I shot you. Okay. Um, so admittedly, you know, my generation, as it were, probably struggles a little bit more in general, but it isn't the adaption, I do not believe, of the electronic health record itself, but more how we are driven to use the EHR as a method of payment so that we become bullet counters. And it isn't about doing the pertinent positives and negatives as I was taught in medical school in the physical exam. It's about making sure I've done the 14 system review of systems and I've done this many bullets for that. And you know, if a parotid mass walks in my clinic, none of that really matters. What matters is that I know that I recognize that it's a parotid mass and I tell the patient about the risks and benefits, that I work it up appropriately and I take care of the patient. And what happens in the EHR needs to reflect what's important about the care of the patient, not what's important for billing. And I think that's where we sort of run amiss with the EHR. Call is important. It turns out if you work more than 60 hours a week, that your risk of burnout increases dramatically. So if your clinic time and your operating time or your patient face time and, and even the EHR time is approaching 50, 55 hours without call, and then you have a bad night of call or two in a row, then, and that starts happening consistently, then your risk of burnout. Um, RVU targets, there are people who I think with relatively good justification believe that if we do not disassociate work targets and volume from payment, that we're going to continue to have this escalating problem of burnout. And there's some significant data to support that. So RVU targets are one. Non-value added work. So here's an electronic uh, medical record issue with non-value added work that happened to me just a little over a year, year and a half. I got called by my compliance officer. Always a great phone call to receive. They said, Dr. Jones, we've noticed that in your history and physical examinations, particularly your HPI, that um, it appears as though your nurse is keystroking uh, the complete history. And I said, well, it turns out that, as Dr. Callan mentioned, my wife is a dermatologist and not infrequently as a, a laryngologist, facial plastic surgeon, she will refer someone for excision of a squamous cell of the forehead or the face or something like that then my suspicion is that the patients you're talking about have had a biopsy documented lesion that's been referred from dermatology or a family practice physician comes. She said, yeah, that's exactly right. And I said, well, it just turns out I created this great template that has every single question that needs to be answered about that. My nurse goes in, I trained her on it. She does it all herself. I go in, I check it, say, yes, that's correct. And I sign it, it's mine. And she said, well, the CMS guidelines say that you have to keystroke the HPI, that that's part of the physician work product, and that we are taking all of your RVUs away from all the ones that you've done the last year for these, you know, and that, that was all fine. But I was like, well, let me, let me just ask you a question. So I need to keystroke it. So if I went in and put a space in, would that be 
She goes, that would be great. <laughs> and I said, so if I put a space in and took a space out? She goes, perfect. And I said, well, that's crazy. She goes, I know, but that's what you have to do. And I said, well, what about if I just added a sentence that said, this sentence is added to make it look like I did the history of physical uh, in this, but I actually didn't. My nurse said, she goes, oh, please, Dr. Jones, don't do that. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Fortunately, CMS actually changed that rule uh, primarily as a result of AMA um, advocacy efforts on all of our behalf to the, to the point where when you sign the record now, you do not have to actually physically keystroke the uh, history of present illness. So uh, finances, health, relationships, aging parents, I think that's one of the reasons that women tend to suffer burnout at a higher rate and emotionally exhaust before men and suffer higher suicide rates. Obviously, I think I, I'm a, a great dad and a great father, and I was involved at home. I gave my kids baths. But I mean, when it came down to when the doctor's appointment was and who's going where and when the the t-ball game was and all that stuff. It's like my wife was a wizard, but that came at a personal cost for her. And I think in, in many respects, while we like to talk about division of labor, and I, I like to think I did as, as, as well as could have been done in many respects, there is a sense in which I think women feel the burden of home. Uh, and I'm speaking as a man, so I'm totally off my, my kilter here. But I think they feel the burden of home in a way that, that men don't and uh, are many times don't. And so for, for those reasons about the home responsibilities and that, uh, that idea of the relationships at home, then women suffer a little bit more, both to burnout and to the risk of suicide. Conditioning and training. Who here wants to let their team down if they're sick? Who here wants to be the, the lazy person? Who here What's all of that we've heard forever, and our training has conditioned us that, you know, in fact, when I was, was training, if we were sick enough to miss work, we were sick enough to be, have an IV in the hospital. And so um, I've actually gotten intravenous fluids in the hospital on call uh, working, and those kinds of things condition us to uh, difficulties. The consequences of burnout, there are professional consequences, poor judgment and decision making. If you feel like what you do doesn't matter, then how important is the decisions you're making? How important are those decisions? Um, it, it is a fait accompli. In fact, they found in many respects that hostility toward patients and medical er errors flow directly from that, that level of burnout. There was a study done in an intensive care unit, once the level of emotional exhaustion hit 30% among the nurses and the physicians in the ICU, the age-adjusted mortality went up 50% in that ICU. So this is a quality issue that affects the care that we provide for our patients. And so it really truly is when we're taking care of ourselves, we are taking care of our patients in a better way. Um, adverse patient events, diminished commitment to care, difficulty relate, difficult relations with coworkers. How many here have experienced, you know, someone who says, well, I put this in the computer, and so I didn't call you or talk to you or say something because it may be that, you know, I didn't want to talk to that person because they are burned out. It may be that I didn't want to talk to that person because I'm burned out, and maybe I didn't want to talk to that person because I didn't think it mattered anymore that I talked to them. But there is a sense in which sometimes we use computers as an excuse to avoid the relationship talk that used to happen commonly, commonly natively in medicine, where we call somebody up and say, hey, you know, now I get a, a referral from a pediatrician for a placement of myringotomy tube through an electronic fax. But I still hope if there's somebody that needs to see me today that they've got a fever of 103 on antibiotics and they're a little bit lethargic and listless, that I get a phone call, not an electronic fax. And so those relationships and the disengagement that occurs as a result of 
feeling that loss of personal accomplishment is really important. So there's also some professional, uh, the professional consequences of personal and depression, which I suffered. At, at some point, when you put aside your feelings and what you've been experiencing, then you become less of a human and that cry for life that occurs is a shutting down uh, from a place of having shut down your emotions. Um, and we learned that. I mean, most of us learned not to experience our feelings in a way that's really important for us as human beings because of people who are afraid to share their feelings because the vulnerability of the truth was too much for them. And so they do damage to others by hiding from themselves. Anxiety, sleep disturbance, fatigue, broken relationships, alcohol, drug addiction. The opi opioid addiction is not just affecting patients, as it were, but physicians as well. Marital dysfunction, divorce, early retirement, career change, and suicide, obviously. When you look at the list of professional consequences and personal consequences, just from a humanitarian standpoint, burnout would be an extremely important thing for us to address in a very aggressive, straightforward, upfront way, both personally and organizationally. And I know things are changing, and Dr. Ganza was actually uh, an attending of mine when I was at the university, the dean of the medical school, obviously. And uh, my son, who's a third year medical student, has you know talked about the things he's done, like a mind food uh, body medicine course he took as a freshman. And those things are helping, but these are consistent things we need to address over a long period of time in order to make a difference. And from an organizational standpoint, just the mortality in the ICU, the malpractice risk, the, the stress that it causes an organization with a high number of their physicians suffering from burnout would make it an imperative. disappeared. Hold on just a second. So Dyke, Drum Dyke Drummond is a physician who is the happy MD on uh, Twitter, I believe. And he has a diagram I have some audio visual help. Is there anybody? <laughs> He's in a cruise in Europe. He's not burned out. <laughs> so at any rate, he has a, a four quadrant thing. He talks about burnout is not a problem. It's a classic dilemma it's because we don't solve it. It's something we treat, like I said, like diabetes. So he divides it into personal and organizational strategies in order to address burnout. And the two ways within that personal way to address burnout, one is to decrease your stress, and the other is to increase your resilience. And you can do the same thing from an organizational standpoint. Decreasing stress might be having all, for example, I know this is crazy, but by having all residents have a scrub, for example, that might decrease stress. Uh, it would be prohibitively expensive, but it would decrease stress. And a way to increase resilience might be having residents get together in small groups and talk about the things that were bothering them and, and or have a yoga class in the morning or the afternoon or the evening or whatever. Those are the kind of things that can mitigate burnout, both decreasing stress and increasing resilience. It turns out that in 2008, Donald Berwick, Insti um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, published a paper about the triple aim of healthcare being increased quality of care, better population health, and uh, decreasing the cost of care. And while each three of those legs are interconnected, the patient is the center of that that tripod, as it were. And that was the slide that was up. Lucian Leap, Morath, and a couple others from Harvard, the Department of Public Health, 
came forward in 2014 in the British Medical Journal and said, what we really need to do is establish not the triple aim of healthcare, but the quadruple aim of healthcare. And that would be having physician care be a part of those three prongs that still keeps the patient at the center, but recognizes the fact that just like in an airplane, you need to put your own oxygen mask on before you help anyone else. That back to Peabody's obiter dictum, you need to care for yourself in the process of caring for the patient. So, see if I can get this up. We talked about before that an erosion of the soul is what happens. And so it turns out that one of the things that's really important, and this came largely from the work of Nietzsche, who was quoted in Frankel's book, um, Man's Search for Meaning, which resulted from his time in concentration camps, both at Dachau and Auschwitz in the Second World War. Nietzsche said, the man who has a why can suffer anyhow. And so part of our ability to suffer well, and we suffer a lot. I mean, don't underestimate that. Because what we see on a daily basis is heartbreaking. And in many respects, life is tragic. And there's not changing that. So how do you live fully and keep your heart open and yet continue to function and retain your purpose? And part of that is, is what Frankel talked about. The people who survived the concentration camps were those who were were, had the ability to find that why, their purpose. Well, it turns out, Shannon felt and others at Mayo Clinic, he's now at Stanford, the first chief wellness officer at a major institution in the country, that if you can let a physician do what he thinks is most important, 20% of the time, then his risk of burnout dramatically drops. And if you let him do what he wants to do 50% of the time, you don't get a significant increase. But dropping below the 20%, you get a 1% increase in burnout for every drop in the percentage he does what he wants. And when I say what he wants, I'm not talking about spending time on the Ohio River kayaking. I'm talking about the things professionally that matter to him. It may be you know, researching um, whether or not there's a, an involvement of uh, uh, tumors with certain kidney diseases or whatever it is. If he is able to do what he thinks is most important to him 20% of the time, then his risk of burnout is significantly less. And so connecting yourself to your purpose is really important. And that ability to do that is what will help keep you from burning out because that loss of a sense of personal accomplishment is the thing that matters. If I could get to that slide. So we talked about self-awareness before and when I showed you it's not about the male. There is a sense in which as human beings we all seek a bit of transcendence. We all want to know that we've lived a life of meaning and purpose. And being aware of that and, and knowing what your why is, is important. And it's the thing that will keep you healthy. Some of that requires some downtime, amazingly enough, because you have to be centered enough to know what's going on in the middle to know, I'm going to advance it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Salvation. So that sense of transcendent. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that, Jeff. Um, getting that sense of transcendence about what your purpose is, is, is really huge. What we used to say in our family, ginormous. Because connecting to your purpose will keep you healthy. But you've got to have the time in order to know that. And that takes self-awareness. So I want you to watch. It's from the Golden Globes a few years ago. From the upcoming film True Crimes, please welcome two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. 
Thank you. I am two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. You know, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just a guy going to sleep. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner, <laughs> Jim Carrey, going to get some well-needed shut-eye. <laughs> and when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No, sir. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winning <laughs> actor Jim Carrey. Because then I would be enough. <laughs> it would finally be true. And I could stop this, this terrible search. <laughs> for what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. <laughs> but these are important, these awards. <laughs> I don't want you to think that just because if you blew up our solar system alone, you wouldn't be able to find us or any of human history with the naked eye. But from our perspective, <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> One more time, here are the nominees for Best Motion Picture. So, a sense of transcendence, purpose. So how do you do that? Be present and live fully. And what does that mean? Tell the truth. Particularly tell the truth to someone you trust about what your internal environment looks like, about your feelings. You know, wow, that patient died. That was tragic. It was it really made me sad. And... I'm glad we were able to be with them at the end. Whatever the feelings are, we need to unpack those and tell the truth about our interior experience with someone we trust in order to be able to continue to live fully and trust the process that that will keep us healthy. Live in community, like we talked about. It, it is hard to go to someone and really want to know what's it like to be with me. What, you know, well, you're, you're really tough to deal with because then you think it's your way or the highway. Well, my way's the right way. You know, and but we need that give and take that keeps us uh, sane. Develop a mindfulness practice. I know a lot of people are resistant to the the importance of mindfulness, but it's what I call a a force multiplier because mindfulness, and that's the the term that's generally described to a meditative practice that was popularized by John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, wherever you go, there you are who took sort of the trappings of Buddhism off their meditative practices. But there are a number of different meditative practices. All of the major religions have them. But in order to develop mindfulness, what happens is we, we get to know who we are on the inside a little bit better by being quiet and neglecting the distractions around us about what's occurring. And it helps us know what's truly important to us and there are some other benefits as well we'll get to in just a minute. And connect with beauty. I found, for me, the name of the book was Finding Heart in Art, that art was an interesting way for me to be able to safely say to someone, this is what I'm feeling, because that was so scary at first. I mean, I was a surgeon. I didn't feel. Doing an emergency trach does not require feelings. In fact, it's better not to have them. And so... I got so good at putting my feelings on the shelf over to the side that I forgot to ever pick them up and get them out and look at them again. And they are going to have their say one way or the other. And so a painting, I could put myself in the painting and say, I feel happy, sad, glad, hurt, lonely, angry, shame, guilt about this or that. And it was an able, a way for me to, to begin to tap into that part of myself that, that I had neglected. And so connecting with beauty is important. It doesn't have to be art. It doesn't have to be 17th century or 16th century Renaissance art. It could be hiking uh, in Yellowstone. It could be walking along the river. It could be talking with a friend. There's in each of us a desire for creativity and beauty that, that comes with being human. And that's why I think, as I said last night at dinner, they, they call them the humanities because those things tend to keep us human. 
the Accreditation Council on Graduate Medical, uh, Graduate Medical Education issued their clear learning objectives just at the latter part of 2018. And I gave a talk there at the ACGME in Chicago in November. And it turns out that in their study of the various training programs around the country, most of the programs, there was an increasing awareness about burnout. Some programs were more aware than others. But they didn't have the mechanisms in place to deal with. They were little programs starting here and there, people from different directions. But in terms of a native uh, grassroots uh, approach, there really wasn't one. And the, the ACGME is struggling to help uh, programs deal with that. I think one of the things it's important to realize, particularly about mindfulness, is it's not just about your mind, in a sense. But they've done studies at the Max Planck Institute in Germany with never before meditators control group, three months, 10 minutes a day, three times a week. Both groups get the flu shot. The group that gets the flu shot that had meditated has three times the antibody response to the flu shot as the group that did not meditate. There's also a sense in which from an epigenetic perspective, we can alter many things. Your functional MRI can change based on mindfulness. In other words, your prefrontal cortex can have more projection, more activity at inhibiting your amygdala, which is the memory of bad things that happen to you, and allow you to be more at peace and at rest in stressful situations. So it isn't just about finding your purpose, but mindfulness has a large number of benefits that go beyond even the things you might consider to be important. So I don't always get sucked into a jet engine, but when I do, I use ICD-10 code V9733XD. When I presented this at Vanderbilt, one of the attendees came up to me afterwards and said, was that initial encounter or subsequent <laughs> encounter? <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. But if you see someone walking around the hospital that looks like Eeyore, which is sort of the moniker for emotional exhaustion, then be kind, be compassionate. They're having a hard day. And as we are more compassionate with one another, with ourselves, it will allow us to be more compassionate with each other. As I say, compassion is contagious. And so try to keep heart. And the last thing I want to leave with you is a quote by Thomas Mark Merton. Art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. And Picasso said, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. So I appreciate the time. I think there's a little time for questions if you have any. Good to have been with you. Yeah, just the way I am was, I think, on that. Just the way you are is on that album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same album, The Stranger, yeah. That, that's, yeah. Getting to your true self, which Merton was all about, I think, is, is a big part of that. So I'm on Twitter at Sean C. Jones MD, and on my website, uh, drseancjones.com, you can have, there's a free burnout quiz. You'll get some feedback if you want to take the quiz. You send me an email. I'll send you a list, a bibliography uh, of articles, books, movies, uh, and other things that might help you in your uh, mitigation against burnout. So feel free to get a hold of me um, through that if you'd like.
Sure. Are you crazy? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and I think my wife and I talked about that uh, a lot. And I think the other thing that's interesting, and I go into this a little bit more in the book, is there's a lot of stress with being, you know, I sort of always jokingly said it's great to be a doctor, but it'd be greater to be a doctor's son. Um, but I think there's a lot of stress with being a, phys a physician's child that people sort of assume they know things they don't know. Um, so, you know, my daughter called one night and said, you know, Dad, one of my friends has got congestion, a headache, and pressure. What, what do you think I ought to do? And I said, well, have them take some Motrin and a nasal spray, and if they're not better, let me know. She goes, I've already done that. I was wondering. I was like, you're practicing medicine without a license, you know. Um, so... The short answer to your question is, I think as parents, we, we want, I wanted what we all want is for our children to be happy uh, and well-adjusted and to thrive. And if that means that he's a, a, not a physician, then awesome. Go do you, you know. And I, I hope that we were permissive enough in our nonverbal communication and what we wanted that we allowed that. Um, at the same time, I specifically told my son when he said that he might want to go to medical school, I was like, if you can do anything else and be happy, do that. If you can't imagine growing up and doing anything else other than medicine, then it's the greatest choice you'll ever make. Now, I would say that about any profession, whether it's engineer or whatever. Do what is in your in your gut, your belly, your passion, and you'll be fine. Are there risks? Absolutely. Navy SEALs have risks. If they were called to be a Navy SEAL, then they'll be a Navy SEAL. Um, so, but I think in the past, a lot of people have gone into medicine for the wrong reasons, and they're obviously going to have a higher risk of, of deleterious consequences from that. So that was my sort of my personal. I think that's the unspoken thing that, I mean, I would say it probably did, um, but, you know, they ha I have to deal with who they are, and they have to deal with who I am, which I guarantee is not easy. Um, and so that's part of, you know, relationship uh, that, that we all, you know, I think had, like, we were both doctors, that's just what we were. I'm sure there were added difficulties, but there were some added benefits as well. <laughs> I'm not going to stress that on you, my friend. <laughs> um, and it is uh, labeled John Jones, Medicine Grand Rounds University. Oh, For that's a very beautiful. Stimulating lecture. Thank you very Enjoyed much. It yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, so you can come down and take pictures. You might want to mute yourself.